little notification there just to tell you that we're live streaming. Sure. Hello, guys. How are you? Good, thanks, Vanessa. How are you going? Good, thank you. So we've got Brad Whitaker and Amy Colley. It's great to have you both here. And um, I promised everybody that we would end the week with a bang. So what is a better place than the north coast of New South Wales and especially the Tweed area? Absolutely. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, <laughs> it's a special spot to be. Absolutely. And Brad, you've been at the club for 26 years. Yeah, I have. I've actually worked there three times. So I actually worked there the first time in 1978, just out of my apprenticeship. And um, then I travelled overseas and then I came back and left again to take up my first executive chef role um, at Moolambar. And then I had my own business for about eight years and I took on this position as exec chef at um, Tweed Bowls. And, and, and talk to me about Tweed Bowls. Um, why why is it called bowls and not bowling club? Tweed bowls club. Well, actually, um, I was wondering whether people thought I was making a mistake when I was no, when I was describing it. Yeah, no. Tweed bowls club. That's that's our name. But we're changing our name. We're rebranding on the second of September. So we'll become Club Tweed. Um, we're spending a lot of money, um, new uniforms. We're renovating a lot of areas. A little bit of a change in uh, direction going for a slightly different market, look after our current market, but look to expand a little bit. There's, we've done a lot of market research, our marketing manager and, and our team. And yeah, it's gonna be really, really exciting. Um, and they're do, gonna do a great job. That, that's, um, that's amazing. So how many venues have you got now within the club? Okay, we've got our main, main bistro, Bistro 16, and then our restaurant downstairs, 1921, uh, a cafe. We do events up to um, 300, and we've got our own butchery and bakery um, on site as well. All closed at the moment due to lockdown. So you're actually on the New South Wales side because Tweed is in New South Wales. So yeah. how far is it from the club to the border? Uh, about a kilometre. So maybe not even that, probably um, yeah, 750 metres. So, yeah, wow. it's, it's very close. It's um, a very strange time at the moment. We're, I really feel sorry for our, um, our cousins in Kulangara. You know, they they rely on us as much as we rely on them, and it's it's a ghost town in Kulangara at the moment. Um, a lot of small businesses are really, really struggling, as, as they would be right through New South Wales. Um, it's sad to see. It's sad to see it in your own, you know, your own town. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been felt a lot harder this time. I, I I think, or just from the feedback I've received, than than what it was last time. Yeah, it, how it'll affect us is once we reopen, hopefully in two weeks' time. Um, the border Queensland will st is still closed for ten weeks, so. That means we don't get any Queensland patrons. So we're really just relying on our Tweed Shire patrons. And I'm not sure of the percentage of, of Queensland patrons we get, but it'll probably be about 50%. So, so explain that to me, what's happening, that the, you're still going to have the border shut for, for an additional 10 weeks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Queensland, Queensland shut the border to, to New South Wales residents. You have to be an essential worker. And very, very strict uh, guidelines. So we've got uh, police and army on the border um, checking. You've got to have a border pass, they check your border pass. And if, you, if you're not a, um, an exempt person, you can't get through, they just turn you around. Wow. So, and if you're a Queenslander and you come across in New South Wales, you really have to isolate when you go back. So people can't come across the border. It's, yeah. So Amy, Tell me, how has this affected um, the work that you do? And, and, and explain to us a little bit what it is that you do do. A little bit about yeah. Destination Tweed. 
Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Okay, so Destination Tweed is an organisation that's um, been operating in the Tweed for 28 years now. Um, so they, look, they predominantly over the time have had a really close relationship um, in tourism and marketing and um, contracted by Tweedshire Council to run all the visitor information services. And they were actually the very first um, destination to call themselves a destination. Um, so that's what they did for a very long time. And then about three years ago, that situation changed. Um, the contract went to a new group. And so they reinvented themselves as Destination Tweed 2050 Collective. And so they became, they're a, they're a not-for-profit organisation, they're an industry group, they've got members um, which are predominantly in the food and agritourism space. And they look to, uh, I guess, support anyone from farmers, chefs, food and be beverage producers um, across the Tweed and surrounds um, by running industry events, chefs, tours, um, you know, anything that will connect uh, the industry, the players in the industry across our space and connect them into other opportunities that we might see come across our desk as well. So, you know, we're a small team, there's only a couple of us, but we've got a great um, board that we report to that are predominantly um, industry folk um, in the Tweed. And um, so, we, you know, a, a lot of our work is driven by the members uh, and their needs and what we can create for them. And then twice a year, we run an event called the Tweed Artisan Food Weekend. And so that's our consumer facing event. You know, that's for me, that's the result of um, all the work that we do and the collaborations that we try to encourage. And it gives an opportunity for people to, well, consumers, guests, locals, and visitors to the Tweed to come and have some experiences over a weekend that give them a deeper insight into food experiences and food culture of the Tweed. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that's where we're an industry group and um, we really try and support what happens across food and agritourism. I love this because... I think that this is such a wonderful initiative. When we, when I think of the Tweed area, I think I know there's a river there, but I actually really know very little about the area. So if I was travelling from anywhere in Australia and I wanted to visit the Tweed area, what could I expect to find there? Yeah, well, gosh, it is um, astounding how beautiful it is and and the assets that it has in the Tweed um, so absolutely the river is one and the Tweed River is just gorgeous it's wide um, it's clean uh, beautiful has beautiful creeks running off it all over the valley um, and you know so we have this naturally beaut beautiful aspect of the Tweed um, that the river is one part of it then we've got the lumber or as it is also known as Mount Warning. Um, its Indigenous name is Wollumba. Um, so this is the core of the volcano, um, you know, no, no longer um, in action, of course, but we have what's left is the core of Wollumba and a beautiful caldera um, which surrounds and provides, you know, gorgeous hills and, and subtropical rainforest. And, um, you know, we've got walkways that are going to be developed and well that are existing but more that will be developed over the coming years so that people can really experience the nature of the area um, and so you know if you're an eco-tourist um, if you're a nature lover you've got so much to look forward to in that space and then we've got a whole host of beautiful fertile rich red soil this volcanic beautiful red soils throughout the no Tweed idea Valley. That, I had no idea the Tweed so did the Tweed area start out with a volcano? Yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Continue. Sorry, I'm just like, I had never heard of that. That's amazing. So this is a World Heritage um, rainforest that we have here and, and World Heritage um, area uh, in, the, in the Tweed Valley. Um, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of our greatest assets. Um, 
I think then food and agritourism um, is another asset and beautiful rich farmlands that we've got, um, wonderful farmers doing really regenerative farming um, techniques across the Tweed. Um, and then, you know, leading on from there, we've got breweries and distilleries and, um, you know, farms that you can visit now. Um, so they're popping, they're existing and more are popping up over, all over the place. And then I think thirdly, you know, we have this incredible creative um, arts culture in our area too. So we've got, you know, we've got the um, Tweed Regional Art Gallery that has the Margaret Ollie um, display there. We've got an arts precinct in Moolumbah. Um, I remember reading a statistic once about having, you know, more creative, more creative people per capita than anywhere else in New South Wales. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all the villages that you can visit and, and that theatre and creative arts culture is really strong as well. But I love the way that you, you protect that culture as well, because you know when you can go to visit um, other areas in Australia that are renowned for their, for their culture, for their history, and you go there and then it's not what you expected it to be, but it sounds like yours is still very it's, you protect that that space and and mm. that area which well, is lovely yeah it's really diverse as well you know um our indigenous culture you know due to Wollumbin and, and you know such sacred spaces that we have the indigenous culture is really strong really beautiful um we're starting to get a lot of art storytelling um throughout i guess creative arts and through food and chefs that are using um, native ingredients and really, you know, tapping into that space. Um, there's so much that's actually grown in the Tweed Valley as well um, with native ingredients. So, you know, and then we've got beautiful Indian cultures and um, Hare Krishna and, um, you know, it's really quite a um, diverse area, I would say. So that's really exciting because then that obviously brings food culture and heightens that as well. And it, it bring, as you said, it it just brings that diversity. So Brad, from a from a a food hub, food destination, do you how much of the championing of these local producers are you able to to do? Um, we we try to source as much produce as we can locally. Our fruit and veggie supplier based in Moolumbah, um, and they, they get a lot of their produce from the local area and our Brisbane markets. And they're, I think they're fourth or fifth or sixth generation, um, the, the fruit supply, Tweed Fruit Exchange. Um, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the, the other producers are just starting to, and with the help of Amy, get to me um, on some of these tours. And I've got a bit of a slideshow later I took um, some of my chefs on a bit of a, a bus trip um, in March, and I'll, I'll show that I'll show that a little bit later. It just shows some um, some of the diverse um, supply, suppliers we've got out there. And Amy was good enough to organise it for us, and and we were blown away. Um, yeah, Woodland Valley and you, Farms. You've lived there forever. Yeah, I don't, I've been at work all the time. I don't get out very much, so just starting. And did to this inspire you now to want to get out? And did it really motivate your team to? Oh. Absolutely, they they were they were jump. They thought it was the greatest thing, and to see it, and and they're all saying, "When are you going to get this past them? Can we get some of those pro that produce in?" And so we we have we've um, Woodland Valley Farms. They made pasta. We we've got that fresh pasta in, in on a bistro in our bistro. So, and it's more expensive, but much much better than the dry pasta. So we're trying to lift lift up our um, our offer, and. Um, and we'll do, once COVID comes out, we'll do them a lot more regularly. Yeah. And so and even, even the apprentice, the young apprentice, it was amazing that when you um, saw how excited she was, you know, and she's an 18-year-old girl and just going, wow, how good is this? Isn't that incredible? Because we just kind of don't do enough of it. And mm. it's amazing when you take chefs outside of their natural environment, being the kitchen, yeah. and, and you let them feel and touch and use the sensory to connect with these with the produce and the products, they just fall in love. 
Yeah, that's that's for sure. That's for and sure. they just have a newfound respect. Yeah. And especially when you have the local producers that you have, Amy, that are that they just work so hard and they're so passionate about what it is that they they create. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think you're exactly right. You know, Brad instigating a tour like this. Um, it, it just makes a world of difference. The things that I hear the chefs say around um, the care that they have then for the food because they've met the producer um, and whether, you know, whether we're talking of vegetables or, some, you know, Tweed Valley pork or, um, you know, silver lining organics, you know, these producers that we have locally, um, they've just got this renewed interest. Um, similarly, you know, we have, Kingscliff is um, a beautiful beachside suburb that we've got and there's a TAFE there and so you know one of our chefs local chefs Adam Thornton um, started to do the same sort of thing started to introduce tours and, and connect his apprentices with um, local uh, farmers and producers and and that's been carried into dinners now that they'll do every now and then like a seasonal produce dinner um, we've had Jamie Ryan also come up from The Hunter and he's um, encouraging this sort of thing to happen as well. So, you know, I, I can see that now we're getting, it's becoming more commonplace to have these local ingredients on the menus and, and chefs, it's um, rather than just saying that, you know, it's, pasta or local pasta you know as brad said no it's woodland valley pasta you know it's um this connectivity and this recognition of the farmers and and uh, connection to the consumer absolutely and brad coming out of covid do you feel that consumers are going to want to see more of the championing of local produce i think so i think so for sure it's it's you know, as I was saying, the the, the not the local knowledge is they they want to they want to know it's from the guy down the road, and I think we all want to support our local people. I mean, it's um you know we've all all been doing it tough, and if we can support someone that's in our neighbourhood, I think it's a really really good thing. And I and I'm sure our customers will too. The feedback I get when we put anything local on um, is always really popular. Yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, it's not funny. It's just interesting to me that um, a good friend of ours, Paul Rivkin, has been banging on about the tweed food culture and the food bowl um, for, for ages. And when we spoke last, I just was like, you know what, I'm going to explore this a little bit more. And then when you, Brad, introduced me to Amy, I'm like, you know what, this is just perfect because... I think bringing it to the forefront is just so important right now and yeah. and showing people to really look around their own local area for, for for products that are produced that they didn't even know about. I mean, you've been there, what, a long time, Brad, and you didn't know that you had pasta being made yeah. in the area and, um, and so forth. We do have, um, the Hunter Valley does this really well and a good friend of mine, Paul McDonald, he actually creates a, created a menu that was a quarter 50 kilometre radius menu yeah. and he had that showcased on his menu inside of everything else that he offers that was just using locally produced products, which I thought was a really good idea. Yeah, we, we've got... Um... We've got a long table um, dinner planned and it's been planned. My, my sous chef, Steve, has is, is been the, the driving force behind it and we're going to set it up on the bowling green. So oh, we'll set, wow. Yeah, so we'll set 100 people outside under lights and it'll all be local produce. So uh, we're hoping we can do that in late November. Well, uh, let me know and I'll definitely come up for it. Yeah, it'll be um, really exciting. We'll get it. We'll get some, we'll get a table of people to the event to support it. It sounds amazing. So when you were talking about this food festival, Amy, that um, that you have in the Tweed area, that you have the artisan producers showcase their products, mm. is this a really good way for a producer to find the feedback or the entry level into mainstream food service? 
Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, this is an event. We've now, we're looking at running our fifth um, Tweed Artisan Food Weekend in, well, it was scheduled for October, but, you know, current conditions, we're looking at pushing it out to the weekend of the 18th to the 21st of November at the moment um, to give a bit more breathing space. And look, what I'm, this, this event started with four experiences over the weekend. So you could, you could book one of four or all four, you know. Um, so they're venue specific experiences. So it's not a, a festival as such where you go to one place and you're all there together. Um, it's an individual farm or an individual, um, you know, for example, we have Tropical Fruit World, um, which is an incredible farm, you know, here um, on our plateau at Hoogen. Um, that, what sort of things? What sort of things do they grow at the tropical fruit farm? <laughs> oh, what don't they grow? What don't they grow? Exactly. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like three thousand different varieties or something crazy. Um, any tropical fruit or um, native or any ingredient almost that you could think of, they would grow it. Um, that's nearly our first port of call when we're looking for something unusual. <laughs> amazing. So, yeah, it is amazing. So the purpose of the event is that the venue creates something really exciting and unique and um, it's nearly an opportunity to pilot something. So they've got a bit of an idea and how can we kind of um, bring our guests a little bit closer and, and create something special for them. So we started with four, we grew to six and then we've gone, you know, to about a dozen and 15 different events over four days. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's been growing beautifully um, and it's and it happened all through COVID as well um, because it was March and November last year and March again this year. Um, and the reason why it did go well is because it's the venues are in control of the numbers. So even through COVID times, they know what their numbers are and they can set that. To answer your question around the, um, you know, the opportunity for producers to get involved, absolutely. Um, you know, we might, we had a lunch and um, there was a new distiller, Cava Spirits, um, that makes Solterra rum. And so they came on board with a local, the Crafty Cow, who does amazing smoked meats. And um, they came and did the welcome cocktail as part of that uh, lunch and just gave everybody an opportunity to connect with this new brand in the local area. So things like that um, have worked really well. You know, speaking of tropical fruit world, we had Christine Manfield do a, a lunch in the avocado orchard, but it was a progressive lunch. And there were, you know, we had um, a local wine distributor, Beaumet Wines. We had Cheeses Loves You, um, which is where Brad visited on his tour, but the uh, local cheesemaker, Deb, Cat Heart Cheese. We had Shuck Oysters. And, uh, of course, Christine making a salad as well. And, and Salumi Australia, which is a small goods company, you know. And so all these guys are, you know, they're members of Destination Tweed. They collaborate together and they all had a chance to showcase, you know, little snacks and tastes in the avocado orchard. And, and people had a ball, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So That's things like that are part of the weekend. And yeah. it booked out so quickly too. I tried to yeah. book and went, wow. It would have been and you great. couldn't get in. You couldn't get in either. No. <laughs> no. Actually, give you that insight. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, talk to me about the seafood around the Tweed area. I imagine that that would be pretty on point. Mm. Yeah. Well, Brad, do you you want to go first on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, we we just moved in a new apartment, and our view look straight out of, over the Tweed Bar. So we can see the trawlers coming in at 6, 6.30 in the morning. So I just jump on my scooter and go down to the dock and buy um, fresh king prawns, $25 oh. a Just And I didn't go yesterday, but they had fresh bugs as well. So, the, the, so all the locals, they get down there at 6, 6.30. The, the um, captains actually, they actually um, text people and say, yeah, we'll be in at 7.30. So they're there and they're sold out, you know, an hour, hour and a half. Um, and That's it's just amazing. Such, yeah. And Sorry, it's, yeah. It's really interesting. I was down there one day and there's this little Chinese lady there and she said, what have you got? And she took all these little bits and pieces. I, I just would have loved to have gone home with her and seen what she cooked up with it. 
It was all the bits that no one else wanted and she would probably have something incredible with it. I bet. I can yeah. just imagine. Yeah. You should ask her. Well, yeah, I should have, yeah. But it's all <laughs> yeah, it's all 1.5 metres at the moment, isn't it? Oh, so, yeah, true. Yeah. But it's interesting to me with prawns, and I know this is probably a little bit off topic, but it's still of interest. And they do they cook the prawns on the boat? Yeah. But they don't yeah. cook it in salt water. They don't cook them in salt water anymore. I have an answer, I'm not sure. Um, you know how when you used to get, um, well, I don't know about the tweed, but I, I know from like Tumbra Lakes or, you know, in different areas that they used to have that beautiful saltiness to the prawns. Yeah. I haven't had that, that. I haven't been able to find that for quite a while. And um, and I found out that it was because they don't use salt water in the cooking anymore when they cook the prawns on the boat. I'll ask them next time I'm down there. But my, yeah. my favourite is that headless green prawns because you're getting, you're getting all meat and still at $25 a kilo. It's just such great value. So the trawler, the, the fishermen on the trawler are actually – Almost like they're they're selling value added products as well. Yeah, oh yeah, they they are um they're, they're all characters too. You imagine they've been out out you know working for 12, 13 hours, and they'll be there having a beer and and selling their prawns. So yeah, it's good fun. It's yeah. amazing. And and what about um like crabs and crayfish and no, all yeah. of that? All of those goodies. Um, crabs, yeah, sometimes I have the Hispanic crabs. So mm. It just depends where they fish um, and the bugs. The bugs were, um, yeah, the bugs are sensational. They're so sweet. Um, and, yeah. and what about oysters? Where do your oysters come from? Um, well, Tweed, Tweed used to have, in the Tweed River, there used to be a lot of oysters um, and they were city rock. And they've almost gone out of business in the area, which is what to do with water quality and that. But um, but there's a new place. Oh, I'm just trying to think of what it's called, Amy, down near Seagulls. The Oyster, the oyster shed. shed. The Oyster Shed, yeah. The Oyster yes. Shed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Oyster Shed. Have you yeah. been there? Have you been there? <laughs> I have been there. So that's, you know, that's a story of um, it used to be called um, catch a crab, which is, um, you know, they caught mud crabs in the in the Tweed River. They um, were, an exi- you know, a business that mostly appealed to the um, international market. And they pivoted last year and created the Oyster Shed. And um, so the oyster part of it is Terranora Lakes Oysters. And, uh, yeah, so it's a new experience. You know, you're right there on the water, this beautiful oyster bar and um, uh, enjoying local oysters there. So that's, it's good, fantastic to see that evolve. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of room for us to tell more of our seafood story in the tweet. Um, I mean, we've had advocates and, and local food advocates and seafood um, extraordinaires in the likes of Steve Snow, um, you know, for many years um, using seafood throughout his menu on yeah, fins. Um, so he's really set the bar high and um, I, I guess it's always one of those um ingredients that's you know people shy away from but I feel like more and more I'm seeing it on our menus locally and um and you know when Brad talks about going down to the trawlers I I bet he sees Snowy there and probably sees Ben Devlin and you know a couple of other chefs um there getting their local catch as well. And you mentioned pork before what what's the pork producer that you have in that area? Yeah we have Tweed Valley pork um, and, and he has another, he does beef as well, Tweed Valley Beef. Um, so we've got a couple of producers, um, or the, sorry, he's the one producer, two labels, two um, uh, meats there in our region. Um, we also have some really amazing, like uh, smoked, um, it's called um, Mount Warning Smoked yeah. Meats. Yes, and so he does beautiful, you know, bacons and, and um, a whole range of um, organic meats as well. So yeah. in terms of sustainability and, and organic and free range, is that all encumbered into, into part of what it is that you promote? Like is how important is sustainability to your area at the moment? Well, 
I mean, for example, Tweetshire Council has a sustainability officer. So they invest heavily in it. And he's a fantastic guy, um, Eli Sandala, that um, is really well connected with all our farmers. And so that dispersal of information, you know, if there's grants to kind of um, revegetate the riparian zones, if there's, you know, regen farming activities or, you know, how do we put more carbon back into our soils, you know, that kind of stuff, um, that information is being dispersed all the time. Then we've also got a groups like Young, Young Farmers Connect. So they're a not-for-profit organisation. Um, they're doing some amazing work across the Northern Rivers, doing field days all over the place where they can showcase um, farmers who are utilising regenerative practices. And so it gives other opportunities for people to collaborate, check out what's happening, you know, take on some ideas, help each other. And so what I feel is that there's this growing culture of how do we be more sustainable um, from everything from our, you know, our, our wastage through to what we're growing and how we're growing it. And if it's spray free, if it's organic, um, can we buy it from the farmer's markets, you know, consumers are becoming so much more aware that these factors are really important not necessarily that it has to be organic but that it can be spray free and it's sourced locally i think that is really important to them and i think it's just having the choice right i think as long as people know um it, there's transparency in 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 the authenticity of what the product is um i think that that's important to people as you know that's what I've found. So, Brad, yeah, we're kind of sorry, sorry, Amy. No, I just agree with you because they can make that choice. You know, if they do want to purchase organic or if they're happy with it being local and spray free and they're meeting the farmer at the farmers markets, then you know that's that's enough for them. Absolutely. Now, Brad, I'm, I I feel like I've kind of morphed into the into the whole food bowl um, piece here. But tell me a little bit about your journey in this industry as well. I'm really keen to know. I mean, you've been at the club now for 26 years. That says a lot about your employer, and it says yep. a lot about your loyalty. Tell tell me about your journey. Okay, so I started. I was um, a little bit like the, the guy you, you interviewed last night. I left school when I was 15 and just school wasn't for me. That was dad, Guillaume. He's actually at yeah, Burley Pavilion. Yeah, yeah. I was really interested to um, listen to the numbers he's doing. I'm going to go up there for lunch when I can. Anyway, I, yeah, so I, I left school at 15 and my dad owned a restaurant. So he said, well, you can come and wash some dishes. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I did that for about two months and I thought, well, why don't I be doing this the rest of my life? Um, so I started helping the chef and started peeling veggies and then making salads. And I thought, well, this is this is good fun. I was really enjoying it. So I um, did my apprenticeship. So my dad had 22 restaurants in his career um, on the Gold Coast. First one he opened in 1969 was the first charcoal um, uh, grill in Australia, he'd seen it overseas and he opened that Keith's restaurant. Um, this is why I love these sessions. I yeah. mean, wow. Yeah, and so he had 22 restaurants, so he had Eliza's, he had um, restaurants up in Noosa and um, all over the place. So I, I worked with him um, through my apprenticeship and then I, I then went overseas. I thought I'm gonna go overseas and did sort of six to nine months and took my chef uniform and in the bottom of my backpack and it stayed there because I was having too much fun. There's no way I was going to go and work. Not for, I think it was 10 pounds a week or something in, in London. I said, no, no, we'll just, we'll just keep on having fun. Um, and then when I came back, I actually started at Tweed Bowls Club. Um, and I was sort of there for a little while and then I went to Moorlamba Services Club as my first head chef's job um, at 24. And, you know, the questions, you know, was in, I remember the interview and said, do you know how to do stock take? Oh, yeah. And what about rostering? I've done all that, yeah. And food costing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't done anything. You know, we, I'd been, you know, I'd been a sous chef in, in a restaurant where I was cooked. I, there was no no training back in those days. So 
it was a really, really sharp learning curve. And ever since then, it's, um, you know, went from there and then went to Southweed Bowls Club uh, for eight years as a contract caterer, uh, which was a really good learning experience. And, and you had to learn about feed costs and stock taking. Absolutely. Because that was, yeah. <laughs> and all the business side of business. Yeah, because it was, that was my, it was going in my pocket or not going in my pocket. <laughs> I mean, I had a pocket, so, um, yeah, I remember. <laughs> Little things, you know. You, I remember we um, were buying the onions in a repeal, and one of the apprentices one day was making this dish. And I said, "Why are you using so many onions?" And so I stopped buying them peel and bought them unpeeled, and we used half the onions and saved, you know, probably saved fifty dollars a week. Um, and and anyway, do you still so, do that today? Um, no, no, just wages. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff comes in processed. Um, we do we do peel our own onions, yeah. It's, and and then I went to Tree Bowls, and, and people probably they sort of say, "We've oh, been there a long time," but we've just evolved and changed, and and always changing and, and moving forward. Um, and it's a it's a real family atmosphere. It's a great. I've got a great team. I've got you know really really good chefs and front of house staff. I've got about sixty staff that work in the catering department. Um. Yeah, so it, it's it's good fun. It's hard, it, you know, like all jobs. It's hard work. Um, so what's been, your what, what's your leadership style? Um, I I like to I like them to you know I'm not there Saturday night. They are, so they, they my chefs write their menus and I I just approve them and basically um, cost them, but they're the ones that are cooking it on Saturday night. So I'm not going to sit there and say, well, this is what you've got to do because. They're the ones that are doing it. Um, so I, I like to, yeah, like like them to really have that input and that ownership, um, that re the real passion come out. So um, do they kind of feed your, so they inspire you by the sounds of it as much yes. as what you would inspire them? They do. They do. And they'll, they'll come in with new ideas or we'll, we'll sit and brainstorm and throw things around um, and, and then we'll, we'll say, okay, well, how can we develop that? And then I'll cost it out and go, no, oh, no, it's too expensive. We can't, that's, you know, the food cost is going to be too high. And then we'll, we'll work through it and then um, come up with dishes. So it's, yeah, it's and do you bring the chefs into that costing piece as well and, and um, teach them how to do that properly? Um, like we'd like to. We'd like to. It, it's, you know, everyone's just so time poor and, you know the, the the wage costing and the, the restraints on wages is so hard. You know it's it is it's, it's a process I want to um, my sous chef and and the other chefs I do give them the information, but to sit down and go through it, I, I use you know we use a program called Cooking the Books. Yeah. And um, so it's the information is there, and every every menu every menu they do. So when the menu starts, they get a booklet. And it's got every all the recipes, got a photo of the dish, it's got it all costed out. So they've got all the information there. Whether they read it, you know, I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, yeah. But it's so important. It's so important, especially when they're doing specials. And they say, oh, I'll, I'll do this, you know, 400 gram sirloin with, you know, a, a bug tail. I go, no, no, no. <laughs> you're not going to sell that for $27, you know. Um, but it's interesting. We, we've been experimenting and trying a few dishes and, and sort of lifting the price and, and lifting the, the, the product up and um, they're going really, really well. So the traditional thought that a bowl is called, they just want cheap, cheap, fast food, um, it's, that's not the case anymore at all. But clubs have evolved so much over yeah, the last absolutely. 15 years. I mean, the, the food coming out of clubs, I think is just, it's unsurpassed. I mean, the chefs yeah. in these clubs are incredible. Yeah, and, and the volume of food that we do and consistently, and we, we get regular patrons. So we get patrons that come five, six days a week. So it's got to be consistent. It's got to be always, you know, on. Yeah, just got to be spot on. So how do you keep invigorating your ideas? Where do you draw your inspiration from? Do you get around and have a look at other clubs? Do you have a look overseas? Where, do you, where does that come from? Um. Yeah, I like going overseas. <laughs> um, yeah, well, up and up until COVID, my wife and I would go overseas every year. We go um, the last five or six years, and some of those trips would be food related. 
Um, we just went down to Tasmania recently, and that was awesome. The food Isn't that there. A, I love oh, Tasmania. So I was actually watching your trip on um, Facebook. I was like, oh, yeah. yes, I went there. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, gosh, yeah. I didn't go there. I'll go there next time. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's there. Um, and we always, whenever we go to any new city, we the first thing we do is do a food walking tour. Um, the best way to, to get to, to know the city you're in, the, the culture, the the food, where to go and what to eat. And um, and most of our holidays are, you know, we've got five or six food to walking tours booked in and that's that's our holiday. It's, um, so did so you come back and put scallop menus on, scallop pies on your menu? No, I didn't, but yeah. Well, why would you? I'm just going, I'm just guessing. But, I, I, see, yeah, I, I wasn't that impressed with the scallop pie, but anyway. It, um, mm. It's yeah, fun. it's amazing though. I think that when you go to Tasmania, you, you do have to have one. Oh, for sure. Well, we drove up to Richmond and had one at the little bakery up there. It was great. Did you do the Huon Trail? No. It's no. it's pretty sensational. Yeah, next time. We just went up the East Coast and um, up to Bishanau. It was great up there. We did a really, really great tour up there called a long lunch tour. And um, this guy picked us up in the van and it was a food and wine tour. So we had a lot of fun. There was about 12 people on the bus and it was yeah, we had a blast. It's incredible. So, so Amy, coming back to you again now, sorry, I'm trying to like share the love here. You mentioned before that you had um, distilleries around the Tweed area. Have, have you started to see more beer and food matching? Oh, look, I noticed uh, the last Tweed Artisan Food Weekend, we had Johnny Franco's place, a, a restaurant in Moolamba, who did that. And he really, um, yes, went out of his way to kind of do like a five-course menu that had local drinks, um, like a hard kombucha and um, several beers. And, yeah, we've got um, Husk Distillery. Um, so he, he really matched all of his courses with a whole range, not just um, not just beer. Yeah, he, re, uh, he had a whole range of drinks, local drinks. Mm. So really cool. And Hoss, Hoss Distillery is great, great venue, isn't it? It's, um, it's so amazing. You, yeah, it's, you can go there and get the paddle and you can get all the different yeah. um, types of beer taste to taste. Well, this one, this is our gin distillery. Um, do you, are you familiar with Ink Gin? Yeah. So Ink, um, the purple gin that they sort of became famous for, but they do some incredible rum. Um, so you can go and do a, a tasting paddle of all the rums or, yes, we've got some breweries. We've got Stone and Wood and um, uh, Earth Brewery as well. And so they all give you those experiences. It'll be interesting to see if rum becomes the new gin. Gin's kind of been the, you know, the in-on-trend liquor for, for, I don't know, it just seemed to be quite trendy. Be interesting to see if rum is, but people go a bit stupid on rum. Yeah, I, I think whiskey will be the whiskey. Yeah. I noticed that down in Tasmania and they said they, they um, the whiskey takes longer, so they make the gin and sell the gin so you get some money while yeah. the whiskey matures. So I think... We'll see some whiskey being made up here too, which will be will be exciting. Yeah, that'll be really exciting. Yeah. So, Brad, do you want to? And Amy, can you do you want to take us through your little presentation that you've got just to showcase the visual showcase of the tweed? Sure. This is. Hang on, I'll just get it up in the right. Oops. And Amy, you can jump in too because you'll. Um. So is that coming up on the screen? It is. Yes. Okay. Well done. Okay, sorry. Hang on, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, that so crumpets. Uh, yeah, I'll get the start. Okay. <laughs> so that's Tim. So Amy, Amy helped put this together, and this was to take my chefs um, just for a day out. It was on a Monday, um, just before Christmas. Um, so yeah, so we had yeah had a great day out. So. First guy is Tim from um, Sourdough Crumpet Company. In so that's organic sourdough crumpets, um, and they are just divine. They're just so good. We got his recipe, but he wouldn't give us quantities. But yeah, he's he's got a baker's flour. <laughs> so yeah. you got to play around with it and try and guess it. Yeah, well, so he's got a baker's flour, wholemeal flour, spelt, sugar, salt, um, bicarb, and ghee, 
Um, but he wouldn't give us the exact recipe. So have but you it, done much with sourdough? As in making it? No. Yeah. No. It, it's funny. I, I seem to be busier. When we're in lockdown, I seem to be busier than than what um, I am normally because we, we're just trying to keep things going at the club and and like the last two weeks I've been doing putting a new till system in. So Okay. Yeah. So they, they cook all the they cook all the, the crumpets there on the, on a griddle, all hand done. Um, yeah, and there's some smaller ones for some of the hotels up the coast. Um, wow. it, also, it also makes oh. a, a lemon myrtle curd and a passion fruit curd. And oh, there you go. Looks, how good's that look? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he makes this um, honeycomb macadamia butter. Oh and, my gosh. It was, um, yeah. So, Amy, Tim's an ex chef, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And um, yeah, he created this project, um, I believe, just before COVID last year, yeah. sort of on the side. But, um, you know, it, it just boomed through COVID. He started delivering and, you know, we helped diverse information to as many people as we could. And people started supporting him and putting in orders. Um, and so from those avenues, then he just started going gangbusters through retail. Yeah. That's and then, incredible. Yeah, and then we went to Jesus Loves You. That's Deb and Jim. Um, they're in Upper Barring Bar. And I think history there, it was his grandfather's farm. Yeah. Um, the grandfather had owned it for, you know, they'd been the family for 100 years. And then the farm was going to just fade away. And Deb, they sort of, they sort of decided to take it over. So Jim does the dairy and Deb's the cheesemaker. And um, there she is. So you see the wall behind her? That's yep. the, the milk just outside the wall. So there's a, a pull of about a metre. And the milk straight into a vat. It's um, and then she does a lot of the markets around the place. You know the Byron Bay markets and Mullum, uh, Kingsley farmers markets. Um, I love how she's got their cultured butter unsalted, fermented with two French bacterial culture. Yeah, yeah. Like that's really cool. Yeah, Deb did did some training in Italy and um, England and 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 uh, France as well. So she's. Yeah, she's such a she's a lovely lady. Um, there she's showing the dairy. So, so dairy was pretty spotless. And some of her, they got ninety five Jersey cows on the beautiful farm at Barringa. Um, some of the cheeses. So we um, we got to try it. So it was interesting trying to get the apprentices to try the stills and you know try the um, the bluey. She calls it the bluey. Um, oh wow. Yeah, she's um, it's sort of washed brine and it's aged cheese. I think there's one of the little calves. <laughs> so cute. There they are. Um, and then we went to a, a place called Pocket Herbs at Burring Bar. Um, and they've been, I think, in that business since 2008. They employ about 20 staff. They do cut herbs and they do potted herbs. Um, I don't think they do flowers anymore, do they, Amy? I don't think so. Not currently, as far as I'm aware. I don't think so. Um, and they use a soilless growing technique and there's no fungicides, no chemicals. And they're really, um, yeah, it was really interesting how they, they reuse their waters and all that sort of stuff. It was, and just yeah, some of the seedlings they develop and they've got these big sheds and they're all, it's all computer controls. Um, wow. So, you know, it's all, you know, it's monitored 24 hours a day and the fans and the sprays, so if it gets too hot, the water sprays, the fans come on. It was pretty, pretty amazing um, setup. That's Some pretty. Of the, yeah. And the, the little potty one. So you, you see them in Woolies and Coles, the little potted herbs. And, um, Gee, they're beautiful and healthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Is that like a succulent, that one? Yeah, it was a... Um, for sale or something, I'm just all the leaves. So they'll, they'll grow these and just cut these leaves. So you, you know, so you don't have to. If you want a restaurant, you just want the, the micro leaves. You can buy the leaves. Um, and the flavors were just just amazing. And saltbush, they're doing a real lot with saltbush. Oh wow! Uh, 
Like that, what if they oh, feed their cows on the near the salt bush? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. They were just they were sort of saying they were still developing it and and experimenting. They had a whole um, a whole shed full of them. So, um, and then we went to Woodland Valley Farms. And it's Fabian with his <laughs> his little chicken houses, which um, I think the next photo. Yeah, this is little chicken caravans, and so it's all free range. So they just park the park the caravan there. The chooks go in there and and eat and um, lay their eggs. And then when they've eaten all the grass, he just puts it on the tractor and moves it somewhere else on the farm. Oh, that's awesome! And you think, well, wow, what a great idea! And then with all the chook manure that area grows back. Um, yeah, and that's just, a sustainability story right there. Yeah, and look at the um, look at the chickens; they're just beautiful. They are beautiful. No, no stress at all. Um, and this is, we drive when we drive in. We drive about half a kilometer into the um, into the farm or a kilometer, and I saw this dog. I thought, "What's a dog doing with the with the chickens?" So it's an Italian sheep dog. Uh, oh, Amy, Amy. Um, it's called a marema. Marema, marema. That's it. And they guard the chickens. Oh, oh from foxes. For foxes and anything, yeah, anything at all. And you can see that one was checking us out. But but once they once they apparently once they bond with the chickens, that's it. They look after them for life. It's just, just amazing. Oh, this is so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and Amy, you might be able to help me out. I think. Fabian sort of came up just to do free range eggs, didn't he? And then I think the story was he just had so many eggs, he then started um, making pasta. Yeah, absolutely. Started making pasta then um, and now has morphed into, you know, making sauces and custards and, you know, the range just keeps increasing. Um, they also participate in the Tweed um, Artisan Food Weekend. So they did pasta making classes. So people would come and have a glass of Prosecco and have a look around the farm and meet the maremmas and the chickens. And then you'd make pasta, um, a few different varieties, and then sit down and, you know, um, either eat your lunch or dinner, depending on the time of the day of the class, or um, have a local produce platter. And so they were just incredible experiences and, and they'll look to do that again, I'm sure. Just, um, put the photo, just put the photo back to that last one, Brad. Yeah. I love the way that chefs become inventive when it comes to wearing hair covers. Yeah, look, yeah, look, <laughs> look at Callista, Callista with the, um, the headband on. The, yeah, it's on a bun. <laughs> it's meant to cover the entire hair, not just yeah, the bun. It. Yeah, I know. It's, um, but that was in a, in a shipping container that they fitted out. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was. At the commercial kitchen. Yeah, just amazing. And, and he was yeah, such a nice guy. Um, Steve looking like Papa Smurf. He'll film me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're watching, if you're listening, Steve, I'm sorry, mate. Um, Is that Steve, Steve Cherry? Steve Cherry, my sous chef, yeah. He was listening. I'm not too sure if he's still there. <laughs> he <might be>. <laughs> <laughs> um, just some of their pastas, just beautiful. Oh, know, wow. Uh, so they've got squid ink, egg, yeah. beetroot. Yeah, yeah. So we... And you can see the, the texture of the pasta. You, know, you see is that the saffron, or, is that saffron, or is that a um, an egg pasta? Um, I'm not sure. Probably an egg pasta. I know he's, he's um, and then he he, he showed us the difference because they got ducks. Wow! As well. So he, he was just showing the difference between the the hen eggs and the duck eggs, and they they, they do do a little bit of um, duck egg pasta and stuff as well. So it's um. Yeah, it was duck eggs. Yeah. Um, duck eggs are so hard to get. There, there's not a lot of people that are actually licensed to sell duck eggs, and they have a higher fat content for your pasta. It's why they make it so yeah. much richer. Yeah, and that's us in the in the work um, bus. That yeah. Um, yeah, it was great fun. I mean, I we, was enjoying that. We were, we left at nine in the morning, and we um, got home about four thirty, and. It was good. We went to a little cafe that Amy recommended and had burgers for lunch, which was just awesome. And in um, down at Brunswick, it was great. So, yeah, there's, there's so much to see. I mean, there's so many other suppliers we really want to get to go to. Um, 
but you know you got to respect that they're running a business as well and it's 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 taking up their time so but we'll um, we'll work on another one what's another one that you really want to go to that you haven't been to yet I'd really like to go to Salumi, the, yeah. you know, the local Salumi guys. Um, but it was coming into Christmas, it was just too busy. I mean, they've we, done well, haven't they? They have, oh, and they're just incredible products. Mm-hmm. So, Love yeah. that. Gee, you guys have done such good jobs. See, I said we were going to end with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and is there anything? So, sorry, Brad, were you going to say something? No, no, it's good. A little good. And before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share that I may not have touched on or that you really want to talk to about the Tweed area that we haven't discussed? That's over to you, Amy. Uh, Well, uh, thanks, Brad. Well, I will jump in and say that um, how proud we are of all these farmers, chefs and producers and the the efforts that they're continuing to do um, to showcase local and we got recognised um, with the announcement last Monday evening in the delicious um, Harvey Norman Produce Awards as most outstanding region um, in conjunction with Gold Coast hinterland, I must mention, but um, yeah, for the tweed. And so, you know, oh, that's... Congratulations. Is, thank you. Yeah, it it's is. Massive. It is massive. It's, you know, most outstanding region in Australia um, is just huge. And so it's an absolute food bowl, you know, um, and I don't think people sometimes realise that, but it's subtropical climate just allows everything to be grown from, you know, all our fruits and nuts and vegetables and natives. And, um, you know, we did some research earlier uh, last year around, what is grown here and and try to create a seasonal produce chart but the thing is that we can grow most things most times of the year um so it's it's um it's just fascinating and i and all credit to um our farmers and chefs and producers that keep striving for quality and and um showcasing it wherever possible but do you know what they all need a gastronomic a gastron a gastron- <laughs> gastronomic <laughs> goddess to be able to advocate for them, Amy. You you are so knowledgeable. I could just chat to you both all day. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. Yeah, it's, it's my whenever I get together with Brad and the and the other guys, we're always like, you know, anything to do with food and, and drinks. <laughs> so if people want to be able to follow the Tweed area on social media or um you know, follow Destination Tweed and, and the Bowls Club as well, Brad, yeah. and just to be able to see what you're doing. Do you mind just um, dropping in your social handles into the chat box on the um, after sure. today? Yep, for sure. Love to. Yeah. That would be really good. And that way people can connect and continue to watch your journey. And, um, and yeah, and ha- happy. Happen. Yeah, and happy for anyone if they ever want to... Um, you know, email or whatever, happy to, to help out if they want to know a bit more about the area or, you know, some feedback. We'd always uh, always welcome that. Do you, do, do you have many um, people that do pottery up in that area as well that make pl- their own plates? And, and, and Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh. We sure do. Yeah, we have a couple of, um, um, like, we have the Mwoolumba Potters club I think that has been going for about I don't even know but over 30 years I remember as a little girl um uh my friend's mum ran that um and so people still love that and then we've had amazing places come about like um stone studio which is kind of a really funky bar cafe with some six wheels and you can do a class and have a coffee or a drink um as well as incredible people like Grit Ceramics, and they're doing some great collaborations with Ben Devlin and, um, you know, just, yeah, showcasing some really outstanding um, ceramics. That's fantastic. Well, mm-hmm. guys, sorry, Brad, do you want to say something? I was just going to say, so when you come up, Vanessa, we'll, um, we'll all get together and we'll take you around the tree. Yes. Um, oh, don't you worry. I'm going to ditch the partner. Well, he might actually want to come. <laughs> And I'm going to spend my time with both of you. And Paul Rivkin, I'm sure, will want to come and join. He'll get massive FOMO if we didn't invite him. Oh, no, Paul will be there. (laughs) Sounds great. 
But thank you so much, guys. I have really enjoyed this. It's put a little smile on my face. And I hope that it's put a smile on everyone else's face that's watching this and you're a little bit inspired. And when you're looking at a, a holiday destination next time, that you consider the Tweed area. Yeah. Well, be happy to welcome you up here. And go to the Bowls Club for lunch, dinner, and do you do breakfast? No. Okay, no. lunch and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks. you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. 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 You take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>